From which state can waters drain into three oceans? Montana is the correct answer. In the Lewis Range of the Northern Rocky Mountains, there is a meeting of three watersheds on the flanks of a single mountain peak. This is not so unusual, except that in this case, the water from each of these watersheds ends up on a different side of the continent. Located in Glacier National Park, the name of this mountain is Triple Divide Peak. In this photo, we are looking southwest. It is a top of the world view. To the left front of this image is a watershed from which runoff will eventually end up far to the south in the Gulf of Mexico and Atlantic Ocean. To the right center of this image is a watershed, the snowmelt from which will eventually end up far to the north in Hudson Bay. From there the water flows into the Arctic and North Atlantic Oceans. Finally, toward the top of the image is the watershed from which precipitation will flow westward over 500 miles to reach the Pacific Ocean. The example of Triple Divide Peak shows us how the highest headwaters are really parts of a larger watershed system. The green line on this image separates two major watershed systems, the Columbia River Basin to the west and the Missouri River Basin to the east. The headwaters of the Missouri River are the watersheds of the Jefferson, Madison, and Gallatin Rivers. These three rivers come together in southwest Montana at a place appropriately called Three Forks to form the Missouri River. Eventually, many other rivers and the watersheds they drain flow into the Missouri, one of the longest rivers in the world. The Missouri River Basin drains one-sixth of the United States land area. Yet as large as the Missouri River is, it is part of an even larger river system, the Mississippi, which drains the entire midsection of the United States into the Gulf of Mexico. No matter where you live, you live in a watershed. Since watersheds are defined by the area they drain, they are in one sense like pieces of a puzzle in that each one is part of a larger picture or mosaic. In another sense, watersheds are like Russian matryoshka or nesting dolls. Larger watersheds contain smaller watersheds, and in turn the smaller watersheds enclose even smaller watersheds. Just as our homes have street addresses, our neighborhood watersheds have environmental addresses. The United States has been divided into 21 water resource regions by the United States Geological Survey, or USGS. Each region represents either drainage of a major river system, such as the Missouri, or the combined drainage areas of several rivers. An example of a combined region is the South Atlantic Gulf region. These water resource regions are the beginning of the Hydrologic Unit Code, or HUC, which is the watershed address. As we will see, you can think of major broadcast markets in terms of their specific water resource regions and cataloged watershed areas. The Missouri River Basin consists of a nested set of river systems. One group is the set of watersheds that make up the South Platte River subregion. 1019 is the HUC for the South Platte River system. Here is a closer view of subregion 1019. The darker blue line is the South Platte River, but you can also see how a tree-like pattern of streams and rivers come together to form it. Notice that the South Platte River region address has been expanded to 1019 00, which allows for further subdivision of the South Platte into smaller sub-watersheds. A water resource subregion or accounting unit is further divided into cataloged watersheds. Each of these is given a final eight-digit HUC. Here we reach the farthest upstream hydrologic unit cataloged under the USGS system. But let's take an even closer look at this particular watershed. As you might have guessed already, since watersheds are like those Russian Matryoshka dolls, a cataloged watershed unit can contain even smaller watersheds, many of which have been cataloged by other agencies, such as the National Weather Service. Here are the individual watersheds that comprise the headwaters of the South Platte River. Two of them are highlighted. There are many websites on the internet that provide information about specific watersheds. Here is one that allows you to explore these headwaters of the South Platte River. The city of Denver straddles the South Platte River. 
as the South Platte extends downstream to merge with the North Platte, forming the main stem Platte River in Nebraska, an increasing area of the central Rocky Mountains and High Plains is drained by the nested watersheds of these intermediate river systems. Denver is a short distance downstream of mountain communities in the South Platte's headwaters, but it is upstream of many other smaller communities along the length of the South Platte River system. All of these communities are encompassed by Denver's broadcast market area. Let's zoom in on the Denver metropolitan area to see how an urban watershed fits into the larger picture. In the center of this image is an area of existing wetlands behind a flood control dam. These wetlands are an oasis for wildlife in the middle of the city, surrounded by dense residential developments. This flood control dam and small patch of urban wetlands are near the headwaters of a small stream that originates within the Denver metropolitan area, flows through the city, and joins the South Platte River. So the headwaters of a watershed are not necessarily located in mountain wilderness areas. They can also be found in the middle of a major city. The backyards of these apartment homes are part of an urban watershed. They are also on the edge of a small wetland area that is an oasis for wildlife in the middle of the city. When storm clouds gather and rains fall into an urban watershed, much of the precipitation falls on roofs, driveways, streets, and sidewalks. Since these surfaces are impervious, little of the rain infiltrates into the ground. Instead, it runs off. But to where? Water is an amazing substance that both physically and chemically carries things along with it. As it runs down the street to the nearest storm drain or ditch, it carries pesticides, oils, pollen, trash, soil, organic materials, and other things. These contaminants may end up in storm retention ponds or in a watershed's waterways and wetlands, where they can immediately affect the various wildlife that live there. Wetlands, green strips, roadside swales, and stormwater retention ponds can act to filter out some pollutants. But in many areas, there are no such buffers, and the runoff is discharged directly into the interconnected set of waterways and the system of nested watersheds. This not only overloads the river ecosystem with sediment, excess organic material, and chemical pollutants, but urban runoff is often warmer than the natural temperatures of streams and rivers, and this heated water can add stress to the plants and animals of the river system as well. This kind of pollution, which comes from no particular place, is called non-point source pollution and should be of concern to all of us, because when storms bring heavy precipitation, what we do in our backyards can end up downstream and ultimately affect many living things. Weather events, such as rainstorms, are often catalysts through which environmental impacts occur for a watershed. A cascading series of impacts are set in motion when storm clouds gather and rain begins to fall. Rapid heavy runoff can carry large amounts of chemicals, sediments, and organic materials into water bodies, where the effects can translate to the whole chain of downstream watersheds. Which of the following factors do you think is most important for determining runoff speed and volume? The intensity of the rainstorm? The characteristics of the watershed's ground surface? Or both of the above? Both factors are very important. The trip that rainwater takes once it's on the ground is determined by both the intensity of the rain and the physical properties of the ground. In general, a more intense rain rate will lead to more rapid runoff because water falls too rapidly to infiltrate the ground surface. Such rapid runoff is more likely to cause erosion and pick up pollutants along its way to the nearest streams and rivers. But what happens to the rainwater once it is on the ground is determined by the ground surface characteristics. In naturally vegetated areas, a large portion of an intense rainfall may enter the ground. But in areas where the soil surface has been compacted or covered up with impermeable materials, even a moderate intensity rainfall will rapidly produce large amounts of runoff. Water picks up contaminants from the rooftops, city streets, parking lots, construction sites, and storm sewer systems it runs over and through.
Because much of the water in these areas doesn't enter the ground, microorganisms in the soil have no opportunity to break down the pollutants. And the effects don't stop with your watershed. Heavy rainfall in your watershed can impact downstream rivers, lakes, reservoirs, groundwater supplies, and coastal areas, 